Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast. Tomorrow is opening day. This morning, then our great hunt. Deer didn't move like usual. Here we just got set up in the middle of this bedding thicket. Oh, and save this spot from the rut. It's a nice, I think it's a nice buck. It's a 170. That was money. I think it's down right over there. 10 yards. Woo! Whitetail Legacy Podcast. Bringing you back to the hunt and leaving a legacy. Baller rut. Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast. We're still on the airways. For all the haters that thought we wouldn't be, we're like episode 32, right? I can't count. I don't can't count that high, man. I'm just like, we're still here, though. Too many we're still haters putting in the them way. Out. We're still putting them out. Yeah, special shout out to the haters. Um, we've, we got some haters out there, and uh, we want to say you hate us, but we love you. So, moving on. <laughs> James Wheeler in studio. <laughs> Uh, in studio podcast, very cool. I love it when they're in studio. I know, it's it makes the whole thing next level. Yeah, I know. Uh, when uh, when you guys like have a guy that's just dropping monsters right in your backyard, you don't even know until you start a podcast. How's that even possible? I don't know. You've just been dropping studs for years, and you don't know. He, he's don't got know. at least tw- he should have he should have at least twelve on the wall. Yeah, I he mean, hasn't mounted them all, but I'd have mounted them all. Yeah, and it'd be at least twelve. He just Europeans a lot of them, but he does use Ingram for the European mounts. Uh, that's our shout out for Ingram on this episode. The guy coming on shooting world class deer uses Ingrams, outdoor obsession to mount his bucks. So if that doesn't say anything, I mean, right? It, you know, if I shoot a giant, I can't wait to take it to him and and have him mount it. I can't wait to see what the job time buck's gonna do. I don't know if he's going to use that or what's going to happen with it, but I'm just excited to, to, just see, to what, see it. Just to see it, yeah. Oh, I thought it was the trade-off deal. Well, I told him, I said, you know, it, it's like to take it to a show, you know, to get the people to draw all over to check out your work. Right. What's better than a mid-150s 8 with a drop? Yeah. Like an 8 inch drop. Not much. 7 inch drop. You know, I mean, that's not much better to draw people's attention. And nobody's really attached to it to be like, oh man, dude, don't mess it up. I had, I had, you know, I had him on camera and, uh, you know, that was about it. So it's a buck that I was hunting, but it's not something that I'm so attached to that, like, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be right if he wanted to use it for, you know, a while to eat. Right. So, but yeah, that's our shout out to Ingram. Uh, Guys, you don't want to, you don't want to not think of him this season. Um, the beetles are just still putting in work. Yep. I'm sure the beetles are eating elk meat as we speak. Oh, yeah. 12 elk they got to go through. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's that's one of the people that make this podcast possible for you guys. Um, next on the list, ECW Calls. We have got our grunt tubes from Jeff. Uh, Jeff has some big news coming his way. Um, I know he's going to be stoked about that. Uh, we got some big news we got big things working here. It's like a tidal wave, and I'm just riding it. Yeah, we got That's big what things happening at, at the Whitetail Legacy crew. Um, very blessed to even be part of it, to even be thought of to be part of that. Um, this it, is my dash now. Yeah, yeah. This is We're living the dash on this on this ride right now. So uh, if you guys do, want, we'll, we'll have pictures up of our calls, grunt tubes. If you guys do want a grunt tube, from ECW calls, um, email email us. We'll we'll take care of the groundwork for you. We'll mail it out for you. Yeah, um, just kind of ma- map out what you guys want on it. Yeah. If you want a name number, um, if you want the if you want the podcast logo, if you want the ECW logo, yeah, just let just us tell know us what you want. Um, you are you are supporting a company that company that's a hundred percent veteran owned. It's veteran made product, all American made product, right here local to our area. Um. Unique, handcrafted. Uh, a lot of work goes into every call. You guys got some skill on the lathe. I know that. A lot more than uh, some plastic call that you're going to buy at the store. That's all I got to say on that. Uh, veteran, innovative products. Just blows me away all the time at what they're doing for what they're doing as a company, 
and then what they're doing for veterans and then what they're doing for us and wanting to tie us into veterans. I mean, even more. Wanting us to help veterans anymore. So Matt is just like the broadhead. He's got his own energy. Yeah. You know does, what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah that's good. That's good too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Only, only broadhead on the market that stores its own energy to release its own blades. And you get that guy started, he's got his own energy. Yeah. <laughs> He's he's just energetic about life. Um, str- he's he's put a lot of work into that company. Um, we're getting closer and closer to season, guys. Uh, I know you guys are gonna be buying Broadhead soon. Really, really take some time and look at the veteran. You guys are not gonna be disappointed in the Broadhead's performance, but it just means so much more when you buy a pack of that than it does when you buy from a huge distributor. One, you're supporting small business. Two, you're supporting veterans. Three, you're getting the best broadhead on the market at the same price as other broadheads. Yeah. And if you guys have any questions about yeah. that, listen to last week and listen to episode 25 because An email it's got to be covered. Facebook message us. I'll give you my personal text message if you want to talk about broadheads because I'll talk about it all day. And I know Ryan will too. <laughs> I'm not super knowledgeable on them, but I'm I'm not near as knowledgeable as Matt. No, but I, I, there's I, not a lot yeah, of people that are. But I... I do have quite a bit of knowledge wrapped up in the veteran. It's just got something I'm very passionate about. Um, I speak about it a lot on uh, Facebook blogs because I just want people to stop going with a mass crowd and using products that are all hyped up by celebrities and start using a product that's real, that supports something other than a company. You know, supporting veterans, supporting active duty military boxes. For the Christmas. middle class. Support, you know, the middle class supporting a small company. It just there's just a lot more behind that name than what and people it, think it is. And it's not just Matt; it's Matt and Cindy and yeah. Chris and you know just his we whole team. We gotta have Chris on. I'm excited to talk to yeah. talk to Matt and have Chris on, kind of get his side of the story, right? And then get some hunt stories from him. Um, I'm really excited. And Matt Matt's just always talking about ripping lips on bass, so I think we need to have. A little fish and talk. Yeah, I have a little fish and talk. I, uh, I know Mike Clark is always commenting on there, and uh, it'd be cool to have him and the veteran on to combine and talk right. about talk about fishing. So that'd be cool. All right, guys, we're gonna get into our VIP veteran broadhead shout out. Um, we had Cheryl Ann. She commented on our post and said that she is a veteran. She didn't give us any other details than that. Um, I wish we had a little bit more, but homie's got. One right? Or you got one? No. no. Oh, no. you don't have any? Okay. No. Well, I'm I gonna hit you. Up. I'm gonna hit you with another one, guys, because we like doubling up. And we got William J. Kelly, another one of those guys that didn't give us much info. Just said that he was a veteran and he would like to be shouted out. So, Cheryl and William, we appreciate your guys' service. No matter what you guys did, it all counts. And uh, that's the VIP veteran brought a shout out. Thank you, guys. But uh, we got another Whitetail uh, episode coming to you guys. This guy is dropping giants, guys. I mean, this guy has got it going on. He's been doing it for multiple years. Um, he's obsessed with everything Whitetail. Uh, we're gonna have an o- we're gonna have to have him on another episode. He has a stellar shed hunting dog, blood tracking dog. Guy finds more sheds than anybody I know uh, in this area. And uh, he's just just an awesome dude putting down great deer, and he took the time to come and talk to us and teach us a little bit. Like right. I said, that's one of the number one things that we love about this podcast, and we hope you guys, uh, you know, learn something too. We we joke here, and we like to say it's uh, it's 90% uh, stories, 5% learning, and 5% bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so... And then, like, 0.5% bush light. Yeah. <laughs> so, because uh, we like to give 100.5%. Yes, at we all do. Times. <laughs> We're up over 100%. <laughs> yeah. As always, guys, we love you. Appreciate you listening. Go ahead and uh, listen to this episode and, and get pumped up for deer season. Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast. It is 12.02 on a Saturday night. <laughs> oh, it's Friday. Shit, I don't even know what night is. Hey, it, it is Saturday. It's Saturday morning, guys. Come on, man. It is Saturday morning, and uh, 
I know we did the intro, but I just I just want to come back at you again with the Whitetail Legacy coming at you. So we I got, say he kind of threw me off right yeah, there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, we got James Wheeler in studio. Uh, I can't thank him enough for coming so late at night and talking to us. Uh, we're doing one of those things where we punch a bunch into one night and put out badass content for you punch guys. Punch a bunch. I like that. Punch a bunch, man. We got kids. You guys got kids? You got kids? Three. You got three? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, we got kids. So the wife wife said, you know, get them done tonight. So here we are. <laughs> All right, James, man, we appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, that's a long drive from Watauga. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this it's been guy, a long day. <laughs> this guy's right in our backyard, and he's just crushing giants. And we we just met him. So. And of course, we got homie in studio as always. Running, I I love these in studio ones, man. Yeah, running the soundboard. Yeah, because we just we just talked for an hour that we should have recorded. I know. You know it, every time it's classic. Like that. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into this is an all white tail kind of uh, podcast. This guy is crushing giants. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna get him out there a little bit. All right, we want to get your story on your crutch, Buck. I seen that pic. Uh, it's just a giant, and you got a set of camo crutches. Are those custom camo crutches? Custom Krylon. Ooh, yes, Ooh. custom man. That is that. So go ahead and hit him with that story, of that Buck, and uh, how it all played out. So I do most of my prep, tree stand prep in August. Um, the particular stand I shot that deer out of, I, I trim back in August. It's, it's in a funnel travel corridor. I don't generally hunt those stands until late October. Um, so fast forward, I think it was October 19th. I climbed in that stand just to kind of get an idea if the deer, you know, the bucks are starting to kind of cruise a little bit. Climbed up in the stand, hung my bow up. I'm going to take my backpack off. Straps broke. So I fell about 22 feet and lay on our, there on the ground. Luckily I had a cell phone on me, called a buddy. His sister was a EMT and I said, Hey, you think you can get a hold of your sister, have her bring an ambulance out? You know, I didn't want to call 911, make a big deal out of it. Well, long story short, they had to bring a uh, four wheel drive flatbed truck out, hauled me out on a stretcher. I had, uh, three fractured vertebrae, broken ankle in two places. Um, laying there on the ground, they wanted to cut my boots off. Well, I had a brand new pair of lacrosse, $140 <laughs> pair of boots. You're not cutting them off. Not today. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the pain of pulling a, a boot off of a broken ankle is something I won't forget. So I ended up local hospital ended up uh took an ambulance ride 45 minutes to another hospital that night spent a few days down there recovered first thing i did when i got home see if i could pull my bow back Uh, i don't even think i made it into the house i had the girlfriend go grab my bow um remember setting a chair up in the backyard and as i was recovering Every day I'd go out and shoot my bow from a little little stool. Um, at some point we'd bought a strap on seat that went you know around a tree, and uh, that was kind of my daily daily routine. Crutch crutch out to the backyard and shoot my bow. Nice. Dude, that is awesome. Yeah. What Dedication. do you do? The, the rut's two weeks away. You, you got to do it. Uh, fast forward November seventh, I believe it was. Uh, it was warm that day. I had a friend down hunting with me from Wisconsin. Um, there was, we were hunting over county away, and there was a little wood lot there. And after hunting it for a few years, that that wood lot, we learned th- there was always a, a big deer that would frequent it during the rut. So fast forward to November seventh, I remember it being, you know, an unseasonably warm out. And uh, I had a friend hunting with me from Wisconsin. He was down, and uh, we'd went out earlier that day. I made a makeshift ground blind on the edge of this this little block. It was like a little 30-acre patch of timber. And there was, there was a little bit of standing corn where they'd missed, and I cut some tree branches and, and weaved them into that corn, found a place I could, I could sit. And you got to remember, I'm on crutches, 
with an air cast on, broken ankle. And uh, anyway, we come back that evening. I remember crutching across a staining cornfield with stocks in it. Oh, man. Trying not to fall on my face. <laughs> carrying a bow, carrying a stool. Got set up. And it was it was getting toward later evening, the time I got got out there. My buddy went down the road to another spot. Um, hold up. Yeah, right here. I'm sorry. All right, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that, that thing's <laughs> live. Go ahead. Oh. So after sitting there for a half hour or so, I turned a can call over. And surprisingly, it... I heard some grunting in the in the woodlot behind me, and you know, not thinking anything of it, I figured his little four corn is gonna come up, pop out. You know, I mean, next thing I know, this buck comes out in the, the field, twenty five yards from me, and I just remember I didn't even have my bow in my hand, and I just remember looking around this little hedge tree that I had for cover in the fence row, looked over and seen this buck drool dripping out of his mouth. Oh man. Standing there broadside, and I don't even have my bow in my hand. And I'm thinking, what do I do? He's staring right at me. He takes two steps out toward the field, and for whatever reason, I still I can't explain it, he turns away from me to go back into the woodlot. That's when I grab my bow and draw. And I, I sent the arrow, and I shot that deer 24, 25 yards. I called my buddy on the phone. I said, hey, I think I just shot a 160-inch deer. You know, he's he's all excited, asked me what what I thought it scored. I was like, I don't know, probably 160. Anyway, I crutched myself back across the cornfield, wait to be picked up. <laughs> they show up. Of course, I, you know, I'm pretty much helpless. I can't go blood trail this deer through the, through the woods on crutches or anything. And they come out and find blood, followed in the the timber about 50 yards and that deer was laying there and here i am standing out in the field wondering what's going on you know <laughs> he comes out he said that deer is 180 inches if anything um once we got it out it had uh two a, a drop off the beam and a, and a sticker and it ended up uh gross and it was 196 inches ended up being the largest deer i've ever taken Three weeks after falling 22 feet from the tree. Um, it just shows you, you know, you can't give up. You got to you gotta push yourself, you know. And a week before that, I'd shot a doe off the ground. Uh, I, I don't like hunting off the ground. It drives me nuts. But, again, I'm not going to miss the rut. You know, I, I like yeah. to hunt. I hunt hard. I had some good friends that come out and help me hang ladder stands, you know, so I could I could hunt. Uh, one landowner come out and put some hay bales up. I could make blinds in. So, but that's my life. Yeah, you that's know, that's I, freaking. I that's that's <laughs> yeah. awesome, man. That I mean, it just shows how dedicated you are. But I mean, how much meaning does that buck have? Let it's your biggest buck. But like most people would have been like, man, I'm just gonna hang my bow up. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna hunt this year. A bad circumstance, you know. And they're playing the why me card, you know. Right. And then here's you out there shooting your bow, getting confident, you know, off the ground with crutches. Because you probably, I mean, it was in a cast. You're probably shooting, like, one leg fully out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably awkward for your balance yep. and all kinds of stuff. You had to pretty much reteach yourself. And then you're going out and shooting, you know, a world-class whitetail off the ground with a bow. And you are in the corn stalks, you said? I was on a, a fence row, yeah. Man, I mean, uh, that's, right on the edge of the field. That's insane, man. That's so cool. That that's such an awesome story to motivate people that, you know, if something bad happens or it, it just you never know when a, a giant's gonna walk out because you probably never thought that you're you know did you have any history with that buck prior to that we'd never never seen him and that that's the thing about that little woodlot it's just an isolated patch of some of the thickest nastiest stuff in the area and those those big bucks will run the does up in them you know in there to breed. And it's it's overlooked. They feel safe. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of luck that goes into it, but 
I was just this just there, you know, the yeah. right time, the right place. You had place. a lot of a lot of good key factors, you know. Just yep. there's no pressure. A lot of people are overlooking it. Yep. There's does in the area. All you need is that one, yeah, that's one hot one. Yep. And like like me, I mean, I don't even know if I would have done that. And I I love deer hunting, but I don't know if I'd have just broke my ankle if I'd have been out there crutching. I mean, how far across the cornfield was it? It was probably 150 yards. And that's, it was long, hot. that's a long so, ways crutching. And you're thinking, man, yeah. it's hot. I'm not going to see I'm no. I'm sweating. You're like, I'm yeah. not going to see no deer. My, you my know? confidence was about at zero. Yeah. Yeah. You think you're going to be sweating walking. I mean, get yeah. some damn crutches out there. Yeah. See how much you're yeah. sweating. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you're trying to walk with and carry your bow and probably a backpack. I mean, that's just a lot. So that's an awesome story to motivate people to get out and, and hunt, you know, and to be a, a world class whitetail like that on top of it is just insane yeah, if i could see a 190 that'd be great that's why i love this podcast <laughs> i mean that story should be told everywhere and it, it you know it's just something that just flies underneath the radar that people don't get to, to hear you know but that that's that's got like movie material all over it you know what i mean yeah so. It's 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 almost worth it to fall out of the tree again. Cause, <laughs> I, yeah, because you know, I haven't shot a one ninety since. But, you know, that's what it takes, man. Uh, I guess I guess this left one here is gonna yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, is it worth it? You know, bones heal. Yeah. You know, it depends on that how deer's good gonna mounts. be on your wall forever. Right, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Memories forever. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Yep. There's very. I mean, there's not a lot of people that shoot them in the one nineties. You know, and hope that deer how? he had twenty eight and twenty nine inch beams. It Gosh, damn! Crazy. Well, so, while while we were in here bullshitting before this, you said you had four deer scored. I'm assuming this is one of the four. What did you feel like when he come up four inches short of two hundred? Honestly, scores never really been a big thing to me. You know, I've I've always been one of them guys. If if that deer is going to make you happy and and you you know feel that you need to take that animal, you know, go ahead and do it. And, gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not one of those guys that base everything on score. If I have a good hunt, you know, it's good memory, maybe history on the deer, you know. To me, it's accomplishment either way, you know. If you can kill a mature deer, that's an accomplishment. Yeah, you won. If you can beat a, game, a, deer, a mature deer in its own game, in its own house, you, you've yep. won, you know. And that's... That's what we hear a lot, you know, and it seems like the people that are true hunters and not, you know, people that are, you know, just in it and end up shooting a big deer, that's what they say, you know, the people that are really in it for, for life, and this is something that they, you know, dream about and go crazy about, you know. But uh, let's, uh, you were talking about it being hot, you know, and all sweaty, and you're on the ground, so let's get, let's go get it in detail on your scent, your scent control, because... Uh, I think in that situation with a cast, I mean, did you spray that puppy down? Or? <laughs> I, I used to go through a lot of uh, scent killer st- you know, products. Um, I'm one of those guys that I believe less is more. I don't use a lot of scents, scented stuff. Um, so now I've started using, I treat my clothes in ozone. Uh, and I think me personally... It's been one of the best things that's come out in the last couple of years in the industry. Um, it leaves an odor on your clothing. And if I can smell it, I know for sure a deer is going to smell it. And I don't know how many countless times I've had deer, you know, not even alert to it. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in it. That particular buck that i shot when i was on crutches was before all the, the ozone stuff and any of that um so uh, i guess my normal routine uh and i i may be more i don't know how you want to put it anal or uh obsessed about it than most people i'll start in september i I don't use any scented shampoos. I don't use scented deodorants. You know, I'm starting early. Um, does it make a difference? I don't know. To me, I hunt a lot of small properties. I try to keep the pressure down. I want the odds as much in my favor as I can because I'm not getting five, six chances at, at big deer every year. I'm getting one or two, you know, so I got to stack the deck as much as I can. Um, 
I don't, you're not going to find me in the gas station in my hunting clothes. You're not, you know, I, I don't, I don't wear them for anything other than sitting in a tree. I, I wear my base layers in my truck. I put them on at the house. I don't put my outer garments on until I get out to the timber. Um, I use, you know, unscented detergents. I wash my clothes quite often. And with, with the ozone stuff now, I don't even spray down. Honestly, I, I, I don't use, you know, I use ozone, that's it. Um, do, you spray, do you spray down, like, your bow or your camera gear or anything like that? No. In fact, I keep the camera gear in my tote, and I do the ozone thing with it. Um, so it's, it's worked really well for me in the last two, three years. Um, do, you, do you still wash your clothes as much as you used to before the ozone? So I wash them before season i'll wash everything right what i what i actually did again i'm probably more in depth than a lot of people i built i took a, a rubber made it's actually like a patio box i sealed it up as, as best as i could and i bought an ozone generator for it i wash all my clothes at the beginning of the year and i keep keep them in there obviously you got you know late winter clothes you got early season stuff i've got snow camo different different stuff so all that stuff gets washed and it's kept in this, you know, box or container, whatever you want to call it, that's pretty well scent free. It's not just laying in a pile somewhere. Um, and, and again, my base layers, I'll put them on at the house and I'm going straight out the door. I take a scent free shower before every hunt. It, if I can't, like if I'm leaving from work, you're going to find me in the bathroom scrubbing the scent free soap before I go. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I do everything I can. Um, I, it's just one of those things that, you know, I, I think it helps me swing the odds in my favor. Um, I don't know what else you want me to get into. No, yeah, that's that's. I good. mean, have you been busted by very many deer before you got really serious so, about so it? So yeah, so yeah, before you would still get busted by deer. You had to play the win, and I'm not saying I don't play the win now. I can cheat it a little bit more with the ozone. I feel. Um, I'm gonna get into this. I don't know. If, yeah, go ahead. So the other thing I do is I hunt high. And it, it drives me absolutely nuts to sit in a 15-foot ladder stand. Most of my sets are 22, 26 foot in the air. Um, and, and I've hunted that way since I, I started. Uh, and that's one reason why it drives me nuts to hunt off the ground. I just, it's not my style of hunting. You don't have uh, any visual on the ground. No, that's my no. biggest challenge out of a ground blind or yep. something. You just lose so much visible and yep. shooting you know you lose so much shooting lanes too yep. one, one thing i feel about it is i just can't hear shit i can't hear anything i feel like that all the from sound the that's coming from behind me and stuff or yeah. you know from the side i'm just totally missing it and that you know whether i'm turkey hunting or deer hunting or whatever kind of hunting i'm doing and i'm in a tent or a ground blind i just feel you know like i'm squeezed in and, I, and i'm missing yep. something I don't like hunting out of blinds. <laughs> I can't. I don't mind turkey hunting out of them, but I don't use them deer hunting. It's you know. Um, and I don't know how much more of this you want me to get into. Go but, ahead, man. Yeah. Uh, part of my dedication again is I run about 35, 30 to thirty-five tree stand sets a year. Um, so again, I hunt smaller properties. And one of my keys is to keep the pressure down. Well, how do you keep the pressure down if you only got 30 acres to hunt? You got multiple stand sites, you know, and, and I play musical chairs with my stands. Not very often do I hunt the same stand back-to-back -back days. You know, the exception will be in a funnel, in a travel corridor, during the rut. You can kind of get away with it because on my properties, generally i'm not hunting deer that are staying there they're 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 coming on that property to search for does um you get an influx of deer constantly um so you can kind of get away with you know if you if you hunt the same stand a day or two in a row you can get away with it but a lot of my my sets 
I have a lot of sets and it's a lot of work. I start in July trimming stands. Sometimes I'm done by October. Sometimes life gets in the way and I'm not. Um, sometimes I'll only hunt 20 of those 35 stands. It's just, you know, the way it works out. But one thing that, that's key for me is, is to not pressure those deer, you know, cause, cause you don't want to bump them on the neighbors. They, you know, they get shot. And you don't want to turn that buck nocturnal if you're getting daylight pictures of him. Uh, so one of the things for me is, is to have a lot of stand options and, and, and don't be afraid to be mobile. You know, I, I've got a set of sticks and a lightweight stand that that's ready to go. You know, if I see movement somewhere else, I'll go out there and throw a stand up. And don't be afraid to hunt it that day because deer are curious creatures and... I've had a lot of luck, you know, killing deer the same day you've hung that stand. They like to come in and check out, you know, what was going on. Um, I think that's something I'm going to be doing more this year. Like, I've tried a couple hanging bangs, but, like, not as much as I should have. You know, I've been like, you know, I got a really good gut feeling about it. You know, I've seen some movement over there, and I'm like, eh, I should, but I don't do it. And then, yeah. you know, there's been times... N- just like I said, not as much as I should have that, you know, I've tried to do a hang and bang and then it, it, it never works out. Yep. You, you got to be there. That's the thing. It's, and, and I'm fortunate enough. I've got a career that allows me to hunt, you know, pretty much every evening. If, if I want to, if I want to go on lack of sleep, I can hunt morning and evening. I've got a, you know, a very understanding girlfriend and family that, that knows this is my life. This is what I do. Um, you got to be there when the deer are especially in my case you know with with smaller properties i don't have four or five hundred acres that the deer stay on yeah that you can manage and pattern yeah it's just like people talk about pattern deer that's just something it's hard to do in small properties i just don't ever think i've had a buck pattern to where i'm like oh yeah i know i got a good feeling yep a pattern pattern for me is once a week pictures yeah you know he's just cruising through there yep it's it's tough, but you you just got to be there and you got to put in the time. Um, and I, I feel I do. Um, my preseason dedication is probably more so than, than a lot of people. Um, I It drives me nuts to be there, you know, the week before bow season, hanging stands, trimming stands, but that's, that's the way a lot of guys do it. And some guys are lucky enough and have – great ground and, and, and can get away with that stuff. I don't feel that I can. Um, yeah, I don't feel like I, I've told him, I said, I like July, you're done. That's what yep. I feel like. If it's July and I'm going in there, I don't even want to be in there. I take my Multimobile, I put lithium ion batteries in it, I hang it, I do all my tree trimming, and I leave. And that's yep. if that's my best spot, you know, I go in there and and I'm hanging a stand for a homie on my lease, pretty much. And I told him he's got to come, because I've never hunted this area, and I want to. I told him, I said, it might be garbage or it might be awesome. There's freaking right. buck sign everywhere, but I don't know if it's daylight or dark. I mean, it's the same rub's been hit the last three years in a row on a big tree. <laughs> you know, it's sweet. Right? It's yeah. it's just, it's hit on both sides where they're traveling to a feed field and back. So I'm like, it might be dark, but i got to get a stand here but I want to be hunting up there. And I said, there, you might as well be someone hunting here too. So I was like, yep. you got to come help me hang it, but I want to get it done before July and then just don't even go out there. Yep. Just and that's, that's the way w- with my rut setups, it, I'm the same way. I, I go in there and trim them in July, August, and I'm not back in there until late October, November. Um, and with, that's with the, with the rut setups. Yeah. I believe what you're saying, you know, July go in there, Cody, just like you, throw in some nice batteries, get the hell out of there on the on the exterior or, you know, a, a nice travel corridor or something. I'm staying out a month before season. So yep. end of August, I'm out yep. at the latest. You know, I'd like to be beginning of August, middle of August at the latest, but sometimes, just like you said, yeah. life, life, work, gets kids, way, family yep. gets in the way. When uh, How many trail cameras do you normally run? Uh, I'm getting pretty close to about 20. So. 
how often do you check them? That's something I like to talk to people because everybody's kind of got their own method. Right. And before you answer that, do you run external trail cameras or do you run trail cameras in the in the heart of stuff? Um, most of my stuff, so early on, is, is field edges, food plots, uh, stuff like that. And then I'll, I'll start moving them again, you know, late October, travel corridors, funnels, you know, just, just to kind of see what the buck movement is. As far as checking them it, it just kind of depends if i'm there hunting i may hunt a stand and check that camera i like to wait a week 10 days at least sometimes it's two weeks sometimes it's a month if i don't get get to that spot yeah but again I, I don't i don't like to blow areas out so i'm not yeah, we've talked to some people on here they're like i like to know what I, my deer are doing i check it every three or four days and i just cringe i'm like yeah. oh man i just and they kill deer it's just it's Everybody's got their own technique yep. to do it, but that just makes me, you know, I'm like, I don't know, dude. I like my my Moultrie Mobile. The batteries the last three months, so yep. I'm not going in there for unless I'm hunting for three months, you know. Right. So. Yeah. So uh, let's get into. Oh, you want to you want to hit him that that question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're saying you, you you're hanging 30, 35 stands. You know, what is your favorite type of stand? Are you you're doing mostly hang-ons, I assume, with yeah, sticks? Yeah, I, I do a lot of hang-ons with sticks. Um, my dad's getting older. I mean, I've got some ladder stand setups, and again, I I cannot stand a 12, 15 foot ladder stand, so they're all you know 19, 22, 24 feet. Uh, if I'm in a ladder stand, I want to be in a giant tree. That's how, the yep. only way I feel comfortable in a ladder stand. I want it to be like one of those monster oak trees where you're in between limbs and right. stuff. And then one of the setups I have on my farm is my grandpa comes and hunts from Missouri. So I have a ladder stand, and then I have a strap on that's like five foot higher than that. I've got that a I couple actually, of them. I yep. actually <laughs> use the limbs of the trees right. to get up get to. Get up in there, yep. So I climb up the ladder stand, get up in that the yep. strap on, because I just feel better there. I feel like I can shoot better. I don't, I don't know. I just. I, I, I'm not a ladder stand guy. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not yet anyway. So, yeah. Um, mostly hang-ons. Uh, I've, I've started to, you know, when I younger, first starting out, it was, you know, buy the cheapest thing. You know, you buy more of them, you know, a thirty, forty dollar stand. Uh, I've kind of gotten more toward like aluminum ones. I like the the Lone Wolf style XOP, which is you know pretty similar to Lone Wolf. Um, and I and I have a reason behind that. Um, so the the other deer you want to talk about. So so late in the winter, that deer I was hunting. It was so cold, my boots were, were freezing to the stand, the steel and stuff. And every time you move your foot, it was making a noise. Well, I don't get that with the extruded aluminum bases. It seems like you're, you know, I, I don't get that noise. Um, I don't know if you've had that happen, but extreme cold. Yeah. You know, you cross a creek, walk into a stand, you got moisture on your boots. So every time I was picking my foot up or moving my foot, that stand was making noise. Yeah, and, and there's nothing worse than that cold day when you that no. first set on the seat that's got the little ice on it. Yeah, it just sounds like you're <laughs> breaking some crystal up there, <laughs> some glass. So, so yeah, I, I I got more toward the aluminum stands. Uh, they don't rust. You know, they they seem to you get more use out of them. They're lighter weight if you got to pack them somewhere. Um, just a more versatile stand. All I I think so. Yeah. The, you know, they're, they're not as cost friendly, but again, you know, uh, you're looking at some of those cheap stands. The first year you use them is, is, is gotten rust. And, yeah. You know, uh, you might be looking at a lifetime stand with aluminum. And then with you, you, you know, falling out of a tree, you're probably yeah. double checking. Everything I, uh, now. I don't run too many stands with, with two straps anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I change the straps yearly. Um, and again, that one I fell out of. I was in it in August trimming it. So what changed from August to late October? No idea. I mean, it just could be my luck. It could have been a squirrel. You know, it could have been anything. Yeah. Um, but that's that's what failed on it was was, was the straps. And 
I always like to go out and readjust my straps at least because I think the yep. trees grow a little bit. And I, they, and I did that with that one. I loosened the strap and retightened it. Yeah, and maybe when you're retightening it, it, it tweaked it, it a little bit or something. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm, I, a lot of people make fun of me because I use, like, the – like the semi truck tie down, right? Like the the two and a half yep. inch, three inch <laughs> ratchet straps on mine with a big crank on it. They're like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Dude, this thing ain't, ain't going nowhere. I'm good, you know." Cause I, I'm I'm real big. I wear harness all the time and stuff yep. like that, and it's just it just scares me. And like I I try to hunt high too. Um, the depends on the tree. If you got if I'm a real big on picking the right tree. So yep. if I got a tree that I can only get 15 in, and I feel like it's the right one. I'm hunting 15, you know what I mean? But if there's a tree that I feel, you know, that I can get up 20 and still make it work, I'll get, I get up high. But, and I like, I'm a real big fan of using the, the three step sticks that aren't connected. So you, okay. you can go up, you know, if a tree's got a limb here, yep. and it's, you can move and climb the yep. tree different. And, uh, I like to use six on a set. So, I mean, I get up there 18, 20 feet, somewhere around there. Yeah, and, and you're talking about the right tree. I've got, you know, more than a handful of stands that, that are in trees that most guys wouldn't be in. They're they're smaller than a telephone pole. Um, I've got one I call the squirrel nest, and I, I shot a 162-inch deer out of this tree, and it's it is it's tiny. Um, what I do in, in that situation, it's, it's kind of unique. It's a cluster of maples that come up, and I ran a rope around you know the cluster and i hung uh artificial christmas tree branches off the rope so i've got my cover and it, and it <laughs> Dude, works good. that is a good yeah, tip right that's there a good tip you know and I, and I am i'm 22 feet up in that tree and, I, and i'm telling you it's it's tiny yeah um, but i've killed a lot of deer out of that tree it's in a travel corridor i got a food plot on one side a field on the other and it is just it's a dynamite early season spot um, but you know you, you can't be afraid you know if, if the area is good and you've got a tree you know try it out and, yeah. and if you don't have the cover make something if, if it's if you can I mean there's stuff on the market now that yeah, you know that frames and you know for cover and, and that but um, I've again with ladder stands I brush them in with artificial Christmas trees you can always find one sitting on the curb somewhere somebody's <laughs> yeah. you know after yeah. christmas somebody's upgrading their their tree and it's it's easy to find that stuff it's and a secret white toe legacy it's, tip right there right yeah. there snag, yeah snag the the, the, the old christmas, christmas trees, trees. You know, <laughs> i uh zip ties work great if you gotta you know if you like hunting out of buddy sands that have a shooting rail or something zip tie them christmas trees right on there the branches yeah. and you know they're wire you can move them any way you want at least give you some cover to give you some cover in that all. wide open ladder stand that's no. almost blowing my mind right <laughs> yeah, here i know it's a great tip yeah that's one thing i ladder stands i mean i i've got one on my whole entire property and that's for my grandpa but i've seen some giant bucks out of it you know and yep. it's and and i i shotgun hunt out of it some because i feel like shotgun i don't mind hunting, gun hunting out of yeah them, i just feel like i don't know i just feel like bow hunting i gotta move so much draw Yep. Make stuff happen, you know, rattling, grunting, trying to get stuff, and you just, I just feel like I'm, I'm too open. Yeah, you know, but I, I agree with that. Well, let's get you kind of hinted on your boots freezing on this buck, so I want to get the story of this snow camo buck. But I want to, what gear were you using that day to be able to stay in the stand that long? To so my, my late season gear that I, I use or have been using um, is Arctic Shield. It's, it's really warm stuff and it's quiet. Um, it's it's been a really good garment for me over the years. Uh, seen a lot of use. I need I need to upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that deer, we had no pictures of him. The first part of the season, he's and a lot of a lot of times on these these smaller properties that I that I hunt. Gun season will kick a deer onto him, and. If, if the pressure is not there, if you're not pressuring these, these deer, which, which again is, you know, what I try to avoid just for this scenario, because it helps me in the end. If, if I'm not pressuring my property, this deer gets booted out of somewhere else during gun season. He's on your piece and now he's not getting bothered. He may stay there for the next 
you know, who knows? You know, he and, – and maybe he just came from the next farm over or whatever, but he he may spend the rest of the year there, winter in there. If you've got the food source and, and the cover and, and everything that he needs, you know, you don't have the pressure that he was getting somewhere else. So – and like a lot of guys after gun season, you know, your confidence level goes down for, for archery. The weather's getting cold. You know, it's just, it's easier to sit at home than it is in the tree. Um, so I'd went out and checked this trail camera, a couple trail cameras around Christmas. And I hadn't checked them since before gun season. This is a property that I can only bow hunt. There's the landowner and some other people gun hunt it. So my hunting's usually done the week before gun season on it. Well, I, I started getting pictures of this deer around Thanksgiving time. About once a week, I was getting daylight pictures of them. And, th- and again, this is just a small little 25, 30 acre patch surrounded by, you know, crop fields. And I didn't start hunting that deer till after New Year's. And uh, it, I ended up killing him. There was four days left archery season. The weather from new year's on it was from what i remember it was in the single digits below zero almost every day it was just wickedly cold um but you know you got to tough it out especially if you you start getting a deer like that on camera and you know you got to take advantage of it and and again i didn't go in there a lot of guys make that mistake they start getting pictures of a deer and they they want to blow a set out they think i got to hunt it every day you know I got to be there when he's when he's coming through or w- whatever whatever the case is. I had a couple other stands on that that farm and I would just kind of rotate stands. Now I was only getting pictures of him in this one one area, but I didn't want to blow that set out because I knew you know I from I only got 15 days left of archery season, uh, so I would hunt it every third or fourth day, and I I finally connected on that buck four days before the season closed and to this day I I don't know why this deer did this but he'd actually he followed a group of does and and come about 60 yards from me and ended up going out in the field stood out in the field made a circle and come back into the woodlot I was in come right down the hill right to me 20 yards and it, it was one of the most memorable hunts I've had because, it, for one, I was, you know, targeted a specific deer. And just the the weather conditions and just what you had to endure, you know, to be out there. And it was it was rough. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't like to sweat, but I don't like uh, being cold either. Yeah. So. And it's nice to hear a story about somebody who's out there in the same level that i'm out there yeah. and you know a lot of people you know just like you said just call it quits after the gun season but you know i like to get out there when it's cold i like to get out there yeah. you know it's raining whatever yep but man it's just nice to hear a story about somebody getting it done when it's freezing yeah it's just like my giant buck that from last year homie's really big on me naming deer because i'm like oh i got a truck and picture of this buck and i'll describe him he's like you just gotta name him because right. i don't know which one you're talking about so i named him mr freeze because Late season, I hunted him hard, and I froze my ass off for yeah. that deer. <laughs> I froze. I mean, I literally, I was out there. I was doing like, if I had good, good sets, I was doing like eight-hour hunts. You know, you, in late you, season. You were out there. It was so cold. I was like, you should probably just pull your bow back just to be sure. Yeah, it'll right. He was like, pull you back. Probably, I hunted him all the way to the last day of season. You know, Ugh. just and then it was, it was that second shotgun season. It was so cold this year. And I had 12 does within 40 yards of me. And I'm like, man, if there is a late doe in this group, this buck is going to come. And I, everybody was texting me, man, I'm out of the stand. I'm out of, it was like <laughs> nine. And I'm in there at noon, still like stride. And I'm so like my hands, because like I got my bow hook and I'm using it as my shotgun rest. And I'm standing like ready where, where all these does are. I'm like, because a buck could bust in there. Right. So I'm standing. And of course, I, took my glove off and it's like i'm just holding it on the trigger you know i'm just sitting there like you know waiting waiting scoping <laughs> and then i realized that like an hour has gone by and i've had my freaking hand out of my glove <laughs> so it's done you know and now my feet are done because it seems like when i'm standing my feet almost get colder i don't know why if i'm yep. setting 
and I feel like I can conserve heat but when I'm standing I don't have the heat from like my seat pad or anything but I want to try some of those boot covers this year because that's one thing I really have a problem with is my freaking toes. That's I've I've used them. I again as their Arctic Shield ones and they, they work. I've I've packed uh, foot warmers in with yeah. them. Yeah, uh, I ran I ran. I probably spent a hundred dollars on hand warmers and foot warmers on that bike <laughs> yep. last year. Yep. I'm like, man, I'm just gonna spend the money because I know like I was I got I was getting I was getting pictures of him December like 15th 16th and then like December 25th and it was like. 30 minutes after dark and he was coming right from this area so i'm like man he's got to be bedding here so if i can get in between him i can get him and i never seen that deer and there's even times that i would hunt that area and i'd get that trail cam picture of him i'm like where is he coming from but then i finally <laughs> figured it out where i thought he was bedding and cruising a fence line he was even closer than i thought and i was hunting on the opposite side i was hunting too far north he was south of me and i oh. had a west wind so he's never winding me, and he was hitting a low spot in a creek, cresting a hill, and going right in front of that camera. So about, like, Man. I think it was, like, three days before season, I got a trail cam picture of him. And I was like, I hunted that night. There's no way he slipped past me. <laughs> yeah. But he was 250 yards behind me. And it's I never to get big. Him. Yeah. It's crazy how them freaking deer make you freeze. You're like, what am I doing out here? What am I doing with my life? Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you start to hate life. Yeah, you're you like sit 20, 20 feet up with a nice northwest wind in your face. Uh, yeah, it's you're such a dumbass. Yeah. That's it's all they, you can say. It's what they <laughs> call type B fun because we sit in this room right now, and you're like, ah, twenty feet up, nice northwest. Yeah. You're like, you're like, oh yeah, that sounds nice, you yeah. know. And then you get there, you're like, man, this is <laughs> terrible. <laughs> what am I doing? I should have went home two hours. The wife's text me, yeah, I'm having deer chili. It's nice and warm. I'm like, oh, man, come on, just get dark. Just get dark. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> yep. Get to I've that. been there a lot. Yeah, you get to that point, you're like, nothing's going to happen. Just just get the sun down so I can get out of here without bumping yep. anything. <laughs> so you said a lot of deer that you get on trail cam um, are just passing through. Uh, for this upcoming year, do you have any history with any deer that you're that you got on the? Yeah, I've got one particular buck that I'm I'm gonna try, you know, and that's that's a problem I have, and I'm sure other people have it. Um, I need to to get it in the right mindset to go after a particular buck. Um, it's burned me a few times, you know. It's it's hard. You you get a buck that shows up. You know, I'm not saying on trail camera, but you're in the stand, and here comes a nice buck, and, and you don't recognize him, and, you know, you end up shooting him. Well, um, maybe, you know, in my case, the deer that I've had pictures of is bigger than that deer. Well, the last two years, I've, you know, I've spent both my tags in the same scenario, and I had bigger deer on camera, and it's just one of those things. The heat of the moment gets you. You got a good deer in front of you. And, and I'm not saying... I'm a big advocate for, for taking every opportunity you get because, in my case, I don't get very many opportunities a year at mature deer or, you know, nice deer. Uh, I'll, I'll get one to two, maybe maybe three opportunities a, a year at a good deer. So I, I kind of get the wrong mindset that I need to take, take those opportunities. But, um, you know, as I progress as a deer hunter, I, I, you know, personally, I think I need to start targeting the specific deer, especially now, you know, you got trail cameras now, you can monitor deer and, and keep track of them. Um, they kind of take a, a little bit of the fun out of it for me. Um, I still use them, but th there's no surprise, you know, you, you lose some of that surprise. Before, you know, the trail cameras, before I started using them, like I said, you know, a good deer comes out, you take it. You don't know that there's a bigger deer using that property. So in your mind, you might have shot, you know, a mature deer, and that might have been your only chance. You don't know that you got five other shooters on camera somewhere else to hunt. Um, we've, we've got one buck. I'm guessing he's five and a half, six and a half years old this year. I've got one set off of him set of sheds last year i found one side this year he's got pop can bases he's just he's a good deer and if i wouldn't have been tagged out this year i 
feel I had a, would have had a, a decent chance of killing that deer. I had tons of daytime pictures of him. Gun season, I had him on on the hoof, daylight, you know, and I'm sitting at home with, without a tag in my pocket. <laughs> uh, but we've got a couple others. Uh, my girlfriend's been after. She's got some history with a couple of them. Uh, one she she passed up three four times last year. He's going to be a nice solid four year old this year. Um, she actually had some unfortunate events this year. She she missed one real nice eight pointer. It was probably four year old with a bow. And during gun season, she missed a, a ten that we had a lot of history with. It's probably 20, 22 inches wide inside. Just just a really wide deer. I've got three years. I found one shed off of him. Um, he's still out there. Hopefully, she can connect with him. He's he's going to be five and a half or six this year. So yeah, it's it's looking a lot better for our area. Um, we had EHD there in 2012, 2013, 14, somewhere in there, and it was like we just lost an age class of deer. And I went 2015. I didn't shoot a buck. I mean, we, we passed deer up. We just weren't seeing very many. 2016, we had probably the best year between the two of us, you know, that, or, or 2014, I'm sorry. 2014, we had the best year we've had. I, I killed a 162. She killed a 197-inch buck. And I killed the, the 168 there in the, you know, last four days of season. Um 2013 was another slow year because the EHD and stuff. I think I, I tagged one one buck then, but just put 500 inches down in a year. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. Uh, <laughs> you know, so and that's one thing we try to do. We and especially with the trail cameras, we like I said our, our we got smaller properties to hunt, so you you can't go in there shooting every every deer you see because it's just you know if if something else is is taking care of the deer like the ehd the blue tongue whatever you want to call it um the past few years we've been letting a lot of them walk and and now we're we're just now starting to reap the benefits from it last year we probably had five or six deer you know four years old on camera again and we went three years without having anything over three years old it was just you know they, they just weren't there now 2014 again when we killed the, those three bucks those were the three biggest deer we had on camera and we just got you know luck or, or whatever you want to call it we were lucky enough to to harvest those deer um again though we, we put our time in and, and we hunt i got a question for you uh if say you had a piece of property and you only had one year to hunt it one more year to hunt it and you could have you could have shot you could have tagged out on 150s each year, but you got a giant that to chase. That you you know that you that you hunted last year. Would you would you shoot two 150s because you might not be able to see those bucks grow, or would you shoot? Would you just go for that one buck? That's gonna be you know in the 180s. Yeah, that's it'd be a tough call. Uh, for me, again, you know, going back to scoring deer and stuff like that. That that's never been a a huge thing to me um it's more about you know the hunt the history um again your opportunity in, in my case like i said i don't get a lot of opportunities um but there again you know holding out for for that big deer i'm, I'm not gonna say somebody's dumb for doing it um there's there's just a lot of factors in it uh and I've had it happen. You may, you may hunt all season long for one deer, and then find out later on, you know, he was shot two miles away. Yeah. And I'm not saying you wasted your season, mm -hmm. but you know, it plays on the guy's mind that I had all these other opportunities at, at, at nice deer, and I t didn't take advantage of it. So, so again, it, it goes back to what your own personal goals yeah. are, and and what you know why you're out there and what makes you happy you know as a hunter if you're satisfied with taking that 150 inch deer by all means go ahead and do it you know uh if if your thing you know if your ultimate goal is you want to kill 180 or 190 inch deer you know uh you need to pass up the 150s yeah. or fall out of a tree <laughs> <laughs> <You're> right <laughs> 
Yeah. I just want to go back, you know, like you said, you, you don't have a lot of history, so if you know you're not chasing just one deer. So that's kind of the boat I'm in. Like I haven't had a a ton of history with with a bunch of deer. You know, I've had a year, two year history with some yep. deer. And this past fall, I ended up shooting a buck that I never even seen before, even though he wasn't as big as probably the biggest. You know, he wasn't the biggest one I had on camera, but I had another deer that was comparable to him, probably a little smaller. But I ended up shooting him. And you know that was the deer at the time that I wanted to shoot. Yeah, there's there's nothing wrong with that. Because you're not promised another opportunity exactly. like that, you know, at the one that you're chasing. Yep. And I know that there's a bunch of people out there now that are targeting deer and they are doing everything right and they are getting it done. It's just for me now, like, if I do say, hey, I want to shoot this buck, and then I do shoot it, like, it, nothing could be any better than that. But if I don't shoot him and I still shot another great buck, then that's still awesome. Like I'm, yeah, st- I'm still, still pumped still up about that. It's still an accomplishment, sure. Yeah. How do you feel, how much do you think it messes up a property if you go in and shoot a buck and then you're dragging him out, you're tracking him, you know? Or even does. Yeah, or even does. So yeah. I've got a story, not really a story, but um, of course it's, it's gun season and this is back when, when we had a lot of deer in the area. Um, and, and we would take a lot of does. Well, opening day, I'd shot a doe out of this stand, field dressed it, you know, took care of it. Um, next morning I hunted the same stand cause it's in a funnel. Um, and there was a 10 pointer come through probably 140 inch 10 pointer. And that deer was on the same trail that doe fell on gut pile was still there. And I, I killed that buck. I mean, it, you know, again, I think it, Part of it goes back to timing, maybe during the rut, during gun seasons. There's so many deer getting pushed around, yeah. ran around. Um, when I when I'm tracking and blood trailing, uh, you know, I I don't wander around. I'm in and out as much as I can, as, as small of an impact as it can be. Yeah, so. I feel like after I shot my buck October 15th this year, that my rut wasn't as good as it was in that area from I don't know I don't want to say it's from getting that deer out but I just don't it just wasn't as good as it normally is and I wanted to know maybe if in my mind I think that that might have been a factor you know I had three guys out there with me chomping through the wood no scent control on them you know I had scent control but now I'm sweating dragging a deer out you know we're gutting a deer and we're in we're in the the territory, you know, we're in the bedding zone, you know, yep. where I shot this deer, I mean, 80 yards from where he was bedded. So, and then he, I mean, he died 20 yards from his bed. He ran back towards his bed. So I'm in that kind of area. And I just, you know, in my mind, do I, you know, that's another thing I'm thinking of. Do I, do I shoot, you know, a mature, nice deer or do I wait for the one that I hunted all last year and then, maybe maybe you know maybe that buck was bedded maybe that buck was bedded there because i had trail cam pictures of him all summer and then after he shed still had trail cam pictures of him and then i shoot that buck and he disappears in my mind maybe that maybe that deer was bedded there just had got up late or you know got up later than that other one i shot him and now i just boogered that one up and if i'd have let him walk what would have been after him or you yeah. know what would have been what would the rut be like it's just hard to decide it is and like it, you said it's just your personal goal for that year was that a successful yep. year to me yes would have been way more successful if i had shot that other buck yeah you're damn right right <laughs> I mean, right um you know and there, there's so many other factors that you can't control at least stuff that i deal with you got properties owner out out there cutting wood you got you know tractors out there doing stuff you know there, there's there's always going to be that human presence somewhere um you, you can't control it unless you own your own piece of property um you know i i deal with cattle i hate hunting around cattle um and there again you got somebody out there checking them every day or you know every other day there, there's always going to be that human presence and i i think some you know the deer get accustomed to it um but yeah, you, you, I believe you know you, you can blow them out of an area, and, and that's one of the things I try to do is, is keep the pressure down. And and the way I approach my properties is, 
I don't, I deer hunt them. I don't, I'm not in there squirrel hunting. I don't go in there, you know, raccoon hunting in the night, running dogs or, you know, running around. And, and some guys can do it and get away with it. And they say, don't bother the deer. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen it. You can get really close to deer in the, you know, in the dark. Um, my thing is I don't want somebody in there, whether it's me or somebody else, you know, coon hunting, they bump a buck. You know, my properties are so small, that deer runs 200 yards. He's on the neighbors. Yeah. He beds up. Neighbor comes in there at 6 o'clock in the morning. That deer gets up out of bed. Whether he's coming back to your property or not, he gets shot. Mm-hmm. You know, so so I'm, you know, I'm in and out of there, whatever I'm doing. I don't, and that's another thing I do. Almost every property that we hunt, we have a sanctuary on that we do not go in um, unless it's tracking a deer you know, or, you know, shed season, we'll go in there. But we have areas that we set aside and and we don't go in there at all. Um, There's a lot of guys that like to, you know, hunt one stand, walk around, go hunt another one, or, you know, they're they're always moving around. Um, I'm not that kind of guy. I'm going to hunt my stand until I can't take it anymore and then I'm out of there. I don't, I don't walk my timber as much, but again, I'm, I'm dealing with small acres. So, my mindset is I, I've, I've got to do that stuff to keep the deer there, keep yeah. them feel safe, comfortable. I'm the same way. I don't, like, people are like, well, like, I do a lot of my scouting during shed season, which is, yeah, because yeah. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to walk this. Like, I have this trail I go in to get to my stand. I go it, I hit a camera, and I'm in my stand, and that's it. I don't, I'm not scout, because people, you know, people say, well, you know, scout fresh sign. You know, well, if I see fresh sign on the way to my stand, I might hang a stand there, but I'm not going to scout my ground. And the same thing, I hunt small property, and I feel like I, I got a, I got a ton of hunting pressure around me. So if, and I see it. I see it during shotgun season. I see big deer come off their property onto yep. mine, you know, and I'm like, well, that's the same thing that's going to happen to me. If I'm here, you know, I got three four guys out here or just, you know, messing around. People are driving deer, deer getting pushed all. If they find a nice secluded spot to hang out that's 40 acres, they're going to hang out there. Yep. And that's how I feel like shotgun hunting. And that's why I thought about strictly getting my shotgun tags for the state ground. Try to get that draw every year. Just go out there and hunt and see what happens. There's big deer out there. Save mine and then go back in for late season and yep. see if it would improve my property. We've We've got a couple properties that we don't gun hunt at all for that that same reason um in in the deer pile in there and and like i said that's how you can you can capitalize on a mature deer that gets bumped off his his home area you know during those those high pressure times um he finds a better place to hang out he may be there a month he may only be there a week but you you can definitely capitalize on it well we got we're gonna hit you with the one more question and uh You've been super successful over the years, so I just want to – there's got to be one key that you think that makes you successful. Other than luck. Yeah, other than luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would say it's probably my dedication. Um, you know, I, I don't miss many days hunting, um, and it's all – How many days you hunt a year, you think, if you could add it up? I, I don't know. I couldn't even answer that. <laughs> uh, the first, you know, up till gun season, I I could probably count on, on both hands maybe, you know, that I didn't hunt, maybe even less than that. Um, again, I don't hunt the middle part of October a whole lot. Um, I haven't been very successful. First 10 days of season, you need to be in the stand. Um, whether or not you got a deer pattern, um, it's it's just been we've we've killed some nice deer the first ten days of the season. In the afternoon. In the afternoon. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't hunt too many mornings in early October. Again, you know, there's no point in pressuring the deer. Those um, bucks are getting back to bed way before you're getting there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Uh, and then of course November I'm hunting, you know every day. Every evening and probably every morning. Uh fifth through the 15th do you do for, for are you believer in all day sets or do you <laughs> i am yeah can i do it <laughs> yeah not very often i'm a champ at all day sets yeah. i did nine last year man Ugh. i just get in there and just 
camp out. I pack enough food for about four or five guys, and yeah. uh, that's how I stay. That's the tricks. <laughs> well, one thing that I've it's it's worked to my benefit being on third shift. Nobody likes to work third shift, but so I'm getting you know to the stand later. There's a there's a lot of days if if I go right from work, uh, I'm getting in the stand after daylight, but. I can hunt longer because I wasn't there half hour, hour before daylight freezing. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of guys by nine o'clock are ready to punch their ticket out, you know. Um, and I've killed some nice deer. You know, and a lot of people have success with it hunting that midday. Yeah, I'm um, a huge believer in the midday, at least on my property, midday rut. This year, my buddy, it was 35 mile an hour wind, it was, and we're out there, and he's like, there's nothing. We've seen a couple of small bucks, nothing's going to be moving. One o'clock, he's like, I'm getting out at one o'clock. He's lowering his bows down. Here comes a stud cruising in, chasing a doe. Yeah. He's like, grab my bow, grab my bow. So I'm trying to pull his <laughs> bow. My bow's hanging there ready to go, you know, and he's like, grab my bow, grab my bow. <laughs> I'm trying to pull his bow up. Buck sees him, you know, it's just, and, and the buck's at 15 yards. And I'm like, that that right there, one o'clock in the afternoon, 35 mile an hour wind, just nothing good. And here comes a, a stud yep. coming in chasing doe. And it's at that time of the year, that's like you said, if you could be in a stand, you just got to be there. It's just, if, if, yeah, if it's November, there's really no wrong time to be in nah, a tree. It's just, um, like you said, you shot a, almost a 200-inch deer on crutches. In, you know, yeah, and it, it was hot. And it, it was, was hot, not, not good conditions not for the good first conditions. week of November. And, you know, and just boom, there he is. Yep. So. Yeah. So, well, we can't thank you enough for coming, man, and spending spending to one a.m. on Saturday. It's Saturday now. <laughs> talking to us, uh, we're gonna have to come back and and get your uh, girlfriend story. And really, we're gonna have to get on your shed dogs and your blood trailing and food plot and food plots. Man, food you're gonna plots. you're gonna have to come back a yeah. couple times. Food plots has kind of been a new passion here in the last few years. I I really enjoy doing. Yeah, them. that'd be. I th- I think uh I think when fall food plot comes around time we can really we have you in for a fall food plot episode and and start pounding that and then maybe i'm sure you can fill a whole episode up on food plots huh? <laughs> <laughs> we got to have you back on shed hunting because that's a super big passion of mine uh i i call my i tell my wife it's horn porn she's yeah. like how many antlers are you gonna have laying around i was like oh it's horn porn i just keep collecting them and then it's like people that sell them i'm like man how do you sell something that you found i just can't i do don't it. get that i don't get it but but, all right, man, well, we appreciate you coming on. To the listeners, as always, we love you. Thanks for listening. Keep hitting that play button. White Till Legacy out.